All right. Okay. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I've already hit record, so we're all good there. Um, so as promised, this class is on the new forms or revised forms twice a year. CAR has, um, has submits new forms. Uh, or releases new forms, um, and uh, um, and it's in June and it's in December. So the June one came out. It should be out. Should have been released yesterday. Um, so all of these forms should be in your zip forms um, as of now. Um, there's relatively few that are um that are new most are revisions so i'm going to go over the new one first but i want to show you where i'm um where i am uh, getting these from uh okay, hold on all right where, where are we share screen Desktop. Um, you cleaned up my box here. Where is this? Where are you? Sorry, just trying to find it here. Uh, All right, well. Okay, there you go. So what you should be seeing is uh, CAR, Realtor Secure Transaction. Uh, I gotta move this down. Hold on. So if you go up to the upper right hand corner, it says search. So what you're gonna search for is um, June 2023 release. And then the first thing is June 2023 forms release. You click on that, it's gonna ask you to sign in. And this is what this page shows you um, the new forms, the revised forms. Look at all those revised forms. Um, but it also has something called the quick summary guide. So if you click on the quick summary guide, it's going to bring you to a list of all of the um, forms by code by their name and whether it's new and how it changed. So the first one, um, the first new form, it's technically a renaming of form, but I'm gonna consider it a new form. Um, so let's see, uh, it's the ATAC which is the animal terms and conditions addendum, which basically it is um, the pet addendum for a, um, for a rental. Now, uh, somebody tell me um, if you're seeing this animal forms and condition addendum on the screen, because I can't see what yeah. I'm sharing. Okay, yes, great. It's, yeah. it's okay. Here. Great. All right. So, this is this was the pet, pet addendum and then now it's called the animal terms and conditions addendum and what they did is um is they've added some language about service animals and um support animals 
and whatnot. So I'm just gonna go over what they added. And so it gives you options to check when there is a pet. Um, and these, and this line here is to add the pet. It's not to add fluffy or anything like that. I would describe the pet. I would describe a, um, a nine-year-old, um, it comes to mind as a pit bull mix, but you don't want a pit bull mix. Um, a, nine, a German Shepherd mix. Okay, say a German Shepherd mix or a nine-year-old greyhound because I have I had greyhound. So I would describe, I would give the age and I would give the the breed. And if it's a mix, uh, you know, just say so. And why do I do that? Because I had a tenant whose pet died. And they thought just because I had I had approved one pet, they automatically get to add another pet. And you know, different pets have different personalities. So I wanted to screen that, um, make sure it was a good fit. I mean, if you go from one breed to another, one could be um, you know more destructive than than another. So, um, so I, that's how I would do it. I would, I would uh, describe the, the breed and the age. So, and the first option is the qualified service animal. Now remember in California, there's only two types of animals that are service animals and that's a dog and that's a small pony. Um, those are the two types that are service animals and a service animal performs an act for the disabled individual. It does something for like a, 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 a seeing eye dog. Um, the dog guides a, a blind individual. So it, it performs that act. So the tenant has been asked and represents that the tenant has a disability. That's all you can do is act. If it has, they have a disability, and that the animal is trained to assist the following disability related task. The tenant is not obligated to complete the following field as if as applicable, the disability is obvious or an animal's disability related task is obvious. Um, I, would, I would guess that if they were obviously a blind individual, you wouldn't have to fill that out that they are blind and that's a seeing eye dog. But there are animals that um, do tasks for disabled uh, individuals. And that's all you're, you're allowed to do for service animals ask if they have a disability and what, um, what that the animal performs a task for the, for the disabled individual. The second is a qualified support animal or an emotional support animal companion under the fair housing laws. Tenant has provided provider with documentation establishing a need for the animal. You need you can ask for documentation from a qualified um, professional um, as to what uh, th that they need that uh, support animal, and that's all you can do. Or it's a pet, and you'll see that. Um, it goes on that uh, the tenant is not allowed to have any animals on premises other than those designated, including any pets that are just visiting, unless otherwise allowed under fair housing laws. And they would be allowed because they were either a support animal or a service animal. Um, and that it further goes on to say that the tenant represents to the housing provider that the animal is housebroken, has no history of causing substantial property destruction, and has no history of serious threatening or causing harm to persons by biting, scratching, chewing, or otherwise. So that's, this was the, the pet addendum. It is now the animal terms uh, conditions addendum. Before I move on to the next new, um, new form, uh, anybody have any questions on that? Not seeing any, I am going to, where are you? I gotta go back, uh, need to move things around, sorry. Um, okay, the next thing I'm going to, this is a new form and what they've done 
is they have they have split up the buyer and the buyer and the seller contingency removal. They split them up. There's now a buyer contingency removal and there is a seller contingency removal. So um, this is the buyer contingency removal. And what this has done is they, um, uh, as I've said, they've separated it out. They've made it clear, as I said in yesterday in Calabasas' team meeting and this morning in Westside's meeting, that fire insurance and flood insurance, should have added flood insurance, is part of the investigation contingency. Make sure if you're dealing with a buyer that they are looking for insurance as soon as they get into escrow. Um, because as I said, State Farm has pulled out of California. They're putting a pause on any um, policies because they wrote 23% of all policies. The next highest percentage was like 6%. So, um, so they had a huge liability in California and that's why they are putting a pause on it. So, um, so this is the contingency removal for buyers. So remember, there's now a buyer contingency removal and a seller contingency removal. And I know um, checklists have to be have to be changed. That's probably what I'm going to be doing over the Fourth uh, of July weekend. Um, uh, any other questions? Any questions regarding this before I move on? Uh, not seeing any. I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, uh, where are we? Hold on. I've got things in the way here. Sorry. Um, So, Rich, and, for the buyer and um, seller contingency removal, that would be added. That's already added into our forms, right? And then the old ones are already yes. pulled out? Okay. Correct. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this is the seller's contingency removal. And um, it only is like uh, finding a replacement property, closing on a replacement property. That really is the only – it really shows – that the buyer has all the contingencies in, in the in the um, in the uh, transaction. So, um, so I'm sure there are no. I would hope there are no questions on this. Uh, let me go back. What is the next new one? Is... What about the 1031 exchange? What about 1031 exchange? Isn't there a contingency in regards to that? There is not a contingency. It's a replacement property. That's that's covered on that. It's covered on this. Replacement property. Finding a replacement property. So um, there is, it rarely isn't a contingency on, uh, specifically for the 1031. You should be using the 1031 exchange addendum, which has built into it time extensions. Um, uh, but regarding um, you know, finding properties, you should be using a seller's re, um, uh, finding a, a replacement property. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next new one is uh there is a new form for rental property owners rp oq rp oq okay the rental property owner questionnaire um this was a questionnaire portion of the rpod the form is split into two forms, um, and the um, the OD was the rental property owner disclosure. This is the rental property owner questionnaire. So, um, 
Uh, it's intended to be provided with a lease listing or property management agreement. We don't do property management and not with a residential lease. So this is with the listing for the, for the, um, for the rental property owner to do, um, to disclose some things um uh are you water conserving plumbing um well the first one is no to purpose to provide a broker to provide the broker not the tenant with information about no material fact affecting the property to help eliminate misunderstandings about the condition of the premises and where relevant to document a rental property owner's response to contractual requirements answers based on actual knowledge and recollection something that you do not consider material may be perceived differently by others think about what you would want to know if you were listing or le or renting the premises read the questions carefully and take your time um so um it talks about compliance requirements uh, water heater water conserving um carbon monoxide detectors smoke detectors spa bed bugs um proposition 65 warning that's chemicals known chemicals to cause um cancer gas meters electric meters it's just it's just like an sbq but it's not as in depth and it is um um it is between the rental property owner and the listing agent and remember um this these are these questions are answered the same way as an sbq or the tds are you aware and if the person is not aware then the answer is no if there is a yes to any of these these uh questions then um a uh explanation will be required okay so any questions on this what if the the uh, property owner asks the agent to fill out the form no it is how can the agent fill out the form when they aren't the owner of the property it's just like an spq right. you right. don't know, you don't know the specifics about the property um they need to they need to fill it out so um that's that's the rental property owner questionnaire, which was split from the rental property owner disclosure. So, um, so that's that. Uh, and I think that that is all the new. Um, Rich, new can you form. go over the new counter seller's counter? I I haven't finished yet. Oh, I thought you said that was it. Sorry that's the new that's it <laughs> on the new forms okay um, oh my god you think in 20 minutes i went through <laughs> this whole thing I don't know. when there's like 20 things that were revised oh my god all right so <laughs> all right so now we say we go. you're the best broker <laughs> <laughs> yeah that good i'm not okay so all right the first one up is the aba which is additional broker acknowledgement and um it's and addendum they've added the word addendum if um if it happens after um a, an agreement is has been executed so it could be either a listing agreement this is where two different brokers like say west side and, and um uh, calabasas those are two different brokers because they two have, have two different dre numbers so if somebody collaborates on a listing or a purchase, uh, you know, um, representing a buyer or representing a seller, you need this broker acknowledgement. So it talks about compensation breakdown, um, equally in share responsibility, or, you know, I'm going to do all of it and you're going to do nothing. You know, I, I, I would hope that nobody would do that. Um, if you're co-listing something, you should be equally and jointly sharing the responsibility because li liability-wise, you really are. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And it added the agent's name. 
for some reason, the agent's name were never on this document. And so, um, um, so it was, uh, it had been added. So you can talk, tell what agent from broker one is representing whatever the person is and what agent from broker two. So any questions on this before we move on to the next one? Yeah, so Rich, so then that does that mean that we don't need the AAA anymore then if we have ABA? AAA is different. AAA is the same brokerage, but multiple agents in the same brokerage are representing. Somebody. Okay, got it. Okay, so okay. we don't need to use both. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay. Joan, your question is, what if they refuse? It's going back to the residential owner questionnaire. Um, it's a requirement of the, um, of the brokerage, I would say. Um, and I would say that um, uh, if, you do, if you have somebody who doesn't want to fill this out, what are they hiding? So what are, you, what, what are you gonna be dragged into? I wouldn't represent somebody because you're adding liability to yourself and to the brokerage. Uh, and that's how I would answer that. So the next one that's revised is the assignment of agreement. <clears throat> this one, they, it, uh, uh, they added paragraph 1C to distinguish a total assignment where no original bank buyers remain on the contract from a total assignment of one buyer's interest, but other otherwise originally named by buyers. So 1C, other assignments replacing a buyer and at least one original buyer remain. So that's, it replaces either a total assignment, all of the buyers, or you check the box and we're replacing one of the buyers and deleting one of the buyers. So um, that's, that's all the, um, uh, that's the only change in this form, um, but it's an important change because you need to know, um, you need to know uh, who's being assigned, who's get, getting, uh, uh, getting out. What if the owner lives out of state and never lived in the property? I get this question all the time. If they live out of state, never lived in the property, but have been renting that property, for a period of years, then they know about the property. You can't say, well, I never lived in the property. Well, you've been renting it for three years. So in that three years where there are no issues with the property, there was no leaks, there was no, you didn't have to fix anything. Um, if the answer to that is no, there wasn't, then they're not aware of any problems. But if the answer to that question is I had to fix the plumbing under the sink five times, then you know about something. So that's that's what I say to that. Um, I'm gonna quickly, I, I forgot because um, there are several rental, um, rental um, forms that the only thing that was changed was the word landlord to housing provider. We are no longer going by the word landlord they're now being called a housing provider. And I'm just gonna list those. Bed bug disclosure, um, cancellation of lease or rent, um, denial of rent application, extension of lease, 48 hour notice of inspection prior to termination of tenancy, fair housing and discriminant discrimination advisory, housing provider and default addendum, lease rental mold and uh, ventilation addendum, a methamphetamine contamination notice, notice of entry, notice of sale and entry, notice to quit, notice of termination of tenancy, notice to perform covenant or quit, <clears throat> Notice to pay rent or quit, rent cap and just cause addendum. Now you see why there were so many revisions. Tenant flood disclosure and water sub meter addendum. Everything that I just mentioned 
The only change is that it went from landlord to housing provider. So that's that's that. Okay, buyer counter offer. Here you go, Christine. That's the next one up. Um, buyer counter offer. Okay. <clears throat> okay. This was changed. And I mentioned this in Calabasas um, um, meeting yesterday. Sorry. The change was made in the appraisal gap. And what the appraisal gap is that on the contract, on the original uh, purchase contract, in the appraisal contingency, you can, a, a buyer can state that if the property appraises for less than the purchase price and a dollar amount needs to go there. So in this example, um, <clears throat> In this, my example, they give their own example, but uh, my example, if they're paying, the purchase price is 500,000 and the buyer is willing to pay 20,000 in a, to make up the gap. So 480, so the purchase price is 400, uh, 500,000. The appraisal gap, if it appraises for 480 or more up to purchase price, the um, buyer will proceed with the sale and come up with the gap. Okay. Everybody understand that? Look, because if you don't understand that, I don't want to move on. Any questions on that? What the appraisal gap is? <clears throat> Not hearing any or seeing any hands. So all this is saying in the buyer counter offer is that, okay, if the purchase price changes, so say they, oh, somebody has a question. Um, okay. No. Joan, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, in the in the purchase, in the if the purchase price changes, the buyer initially offered um, five hundred thousand. They're now going to offer five hundred twenty thousand. What this says is is that gap which was $20,000, remember, from 500 to 480. That gap now shifts. So if it appraises for 500,000 with a purchase price of 520, the buyer still is agreeing to move on and not cancel because it didn't appraise. So... If you're representing a buyer, it's important that they realize this because if they don't want, if suddenly, hey, I don't have, if I'm paying, now paying 520, I don't have the, the extra because the deposit changes, everything changes. Um, uh, I don't have that extra money. So I'm not going, I don't want, I want it. I want that clause out. So you have to counter it out. Everybody get that? Everybody understand that? That if you don't counter it out, that gap moves with the new appraisal, uh, the new purchase price. Any questions on that? And that's all that was the change in the buyer counter offer. We got it? Okay. All right, moving on. Um, some of these are, are very, they're very like minuscule. So I'm not really going to go over. Okay. Cancellation of contract. <clears throat> okay. So they added language explaining how to fill out the form if one party is canceling. Because a lot of times only one party is canceling, either the buyer or the seller. So they've added language. That's what all that advisory and instructions are. It's, la it's language about how to fill out this form. Although the agent's filling it out, 
but it's information for the buyer or the seller who is canceling. They also added language uh, addressing a partial release if no um, deposit was made. Okay, so let's let's break this down. We all should know that this, the cancellation of contract, is really two forms in one. The first is canceling the contract. So the buyer or the seller cancels, either permitted as by a good faith ex exercise of paragraph. So if you're canceling because of an investigation, then you have to refer to the investigation paragraph in the RPA. Um, so if the seller is canceling, the buyer has failed to remove the contingency after a notice to perform was giving, given, or the seller has, be, uh, um, has failed to remove um, uh, a contingency after a notice to perform. Because remember, you can't cancel a contract unless um, there, a notice to perform was issued. Uh, I got this question today. Well, there was no deposit, so we're, the seller's just going to cancel. No, the seller has to issue a notice to perform. It doesn't matter that there's no deposit. There's still a contract, so you have to cancel the contract. Um, the other um, prop, uh, party has failed to close escrow after be, get, get, being given a demand to close. Okay, so those are reasons for one um one or the other party to cancel or it's a mutual cancellation we're all we're mutually canceling what does that mean then both parties have to agree to cancel that's important and there's a timeline for them um to sign off on this because you only need if it's only being canceled by one person one of the um one of the individuals, either the buyer or the seller, only that person has to um, sign to cancel. So it, uh, you can see party canceling the contract. So if the buyer's canceling, only the buyer has to sign. If the seller's canceling, only the seller has to sign. But if it's mutual, both of them have to sign. So that's the first part of this document. The second part of this document deals with what are we going to do with the deposit? Because that's separate from canceling the contract. Just because you cancel the contract doesn't dispense of the deposit. Escrow will not release the funds unless they get mutually agreed upon um, instructions, mutually, that means buyer and seller, on how to release the funds. So, um, so uh, a full release, so the seller authorized release of the buyer's deposit lets buyer's fees and costs already incurred and agreed um, in the contract to be paid through escrow. So, or buyer authorizes release the buyer's deposit to seller, you are almost never gonna check that box. Um, or the buyer authorizes a release of X amount of dollars. I got a call today about, you know, somebody, a buyer wanting to cancel and the agent is trying to negotiate, you know, they want to keep it all. Actually, they, they were settling on half, but excuse me, she didn't, she didn't think that was fair. So she's trying to negotiate a better term for her buyer to, um, to get some of the money back. So so you can negotiate all of that. And then there is this box check. There is no deposit in escrow. Each, each party to pay their own unpaid fees, if any, already incurred and agree in the contract to be paid through escrow. So, and then there is D, partial release and reservation rights. Buyer and seller cancel escrow and the mutually agree with each other from uh, mutually agree to release each other from any obligation to buy, sell, or exchange property under the contract, we reserve all rights to retain any obligations they have towards each other under the agreement, except for the obligation as applicable to buy uh, and authorize to hold any deposit until receiving. Okay. 
the the that that partial release and reservation of of rights that would be used if I I don't foresee anybody agreeing to this. I have to tell you, I have to be honest with you, because basically that's saying the sellers determined to hold on to the to the deposit. And we're going to go to mediation to deal with that. But in the meantime, Mr. Seller, you can go ahead and you can sell your property. I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to do it. I don't, I don't see a buyer agreeing to that. So, uh, but um, they've added it to this, this document. So, um, so that's, that's that. So any questions on the cancellation of contract? Yes. Yes. Uh, for for the upper side, the, the top part. Uh, yeah. When yeah. You, okay. On this part, uh, when you have when you served uh, a notice to perform and the buyer did not remove contingency or mm -hmm. cancel, and you mentioned about you know whereas only one party signed and sent it as a cancellation. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But, in reality, for full cancellation, we need both parties to sign, correct? No. So one. No, part because if the buyer, if the bot, if remember, I said this is basically two documents in one document. The top portion is the cancellation of the contract. So if the buyer didn't, if the seller gave the buyer a notice to perform and they didn't perform after waiting the appropriate days, then the seller, it would the checkbox seller is canceling the, the, this agreement for the following reason. The buyer has, has failed to remove the applicable uh, contingency or take the applicable contractual action after being given a notice for the buyer to perform. The seller signs this. The, the contract is canceled. There is no more contract. Okay? Then the second part is what do we do with the deposit? That's totally separate. That's where both parties have to agree as to what to do with the deposit. But the contract is canceled. That seller can now move on and market that property, except if you're part of the MLS, go figure. Um, uh, you can market that property and enter into escrow subject to the cancellation of, of a previous escrow, not a previous contract, a previous escrow. Escrow needs mutually signed um, instructions. Got it? Clear? Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. Um, um, okay. I, I'll just quickly um, the disclosure. Disclosure information advisory. The only thing that they really changed on this, but it is a, it is an important change, is that it makes sure that the the the, um, the question one of the questions on the SBQ addresses the seller's ob obligation to provide the pro the buyer any relevant documents, including reports whether past or current in the seller's possession. It's, a, it's an important change that, hey, Mr. Seller, if you have a report, you know, uh, I probably have reports from, you know, when I bought my house. So, you know, I, I would be under obligation to supply that. So um, that's, the, that's the only uh, question, the only change to that. Um, and it's also, a change to the ESD. It's also a change on the ESD. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the, the exempt seller disclosure. I'm not going to go um, go through that. Um, uh, 
and and okay. So Joan, in answer to your questions about well, what if you don't want the seller doesn't the the rental property owner? Um, uh, it's in the lease agreement, broker and rental property owner duties. Number B, <clears throat> RPO agrees to complete a rental property owner disclosure and rental property owner questionnaire, which can be provided to broker within three days of completing um, this agreement. Uh, RPO authorized broker to provide tenant with the RPD completed by the RPO, oh my God, all these, yeah, with any lease or rental agreement. So now you're, okay, the, the, the rental property owner is being instructed, this is a requirement of this lease listing, okay? That you're gonna give me, you're gonna fill out a rental property owner questionnaire, and you're also gonna fill out a rental property, um, uh, the rental property owner disclosure, you're going to fill these two documents out. And the rental property owner disclosure is you are authorizing me to give this to the tenant. The tenant now is being given the rental property owner disclosure. So um it's in the agreement they need rich, to agree to it yes rich, when when was it divided into the disclosure and the questionnaire it was divided right now in june this is okay. what it's this this is when it was divided so um, and, and rich okay rich giving the yes. disclosure um i thought before we weren't to give it to them now now we are i thought that now you are because they're they're divided into into two, two different forms i wonder if Right. Okay. Rental property. And I have to say, Rental. I've done a couple with it. It's pretty nice because you actually get all the information you need without having to right. look for it yourself. So now this here is the the rental property owner disclosure intended to be provided with the lease listing or property manager, and with a residential lease. So this it, it, it's like an SBQ or a TDS for the tenant. So. Um, so it is, it is being the rental property owner disclosure. I don't know why they changed the name. Landlord is so much easier to say. But the disclosure is now be, being authorized to get, be given to the tenant. Okay. All right. Um, and then, Rich, and then other than yes. the, then we also have the landlord, the KW lease addendum as well, right? The KW lease addendum is only if you're representing the land, the rental property owner. Right. It is so not if green. you're, right. yes, yes, okay. exactly. Um, notice to perform. Uh, evidently they changes the notice to buyer to perform. Okay, so, um, Added language to make clear that the the if the notice is given too early for some unidentified uh, for some identified or contract action, it is only invalid as to those contingencies or contract actions, but valid for others. So if you if you said okay, you need to remove all contingencies, but they still have time on some of those contingencies maybe not all of them but some of them so those that they are not that they do not have still have in place those that, what am i saying <laughs> i've confused myself <laughs> so if you give it like all contingencies and if they still have time on some of those contingencies, the contingency, the notice to perform is not valid for those contingencies, but would be valid for the ones that they don't have time for. Is that clear? 
because it was I was confused my, myself. <clears throat> um, I guess it is clear. So I'm not hearing it. And Paul, I have, I have a I have. Let's see. Clients ask for an inspection. Would this disclosure replace an actual inspection? I, I'm. We can't. I, I, I mean, clients want an inspection. I'm. Um, I'm. I'm confused as to. Um, they're asking for an. Th this. This has nothing to do to the move in, move out inspection. This is disclosing, like smoke detectors. Dis disclosing. Disclosing. Disclosing those types of things. Um, it, it is not about does the stove work? Is there a scratch on the floor? That's that's a move in, move out. That the, this does not take that take place of that. So, um, I guess the answer to your question is no. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, cover those. Okay, let's see the purchase agreement probate uh, addendum. PAPA. Where'd you go? P -A -P -A. Okay, the added language. The language to port confirmation paragraph giving buyer a cancellation right. If no confirmation date, with, uh, oh, if there's no confirmation date within 60 days after acceptance, um, they have a cancel. They have a cancellation right. So, uh, if you check that box under four three a four, um, obtaining a court confirmation hearing date within 60 days after acceptance. Um, is a contingency of the agreement in favor of the buyer. So, um, uh, and that is under um, both 3A, 4, and then 3B, court confirmation. Oh, I see. Uh, 3A deals with if we're not sure if it needs a court confirmation. Um, so um, then you would check that and say, you know, if I don't get, if you don't get a court confirmation date within 60 days, if you find out that it is indeed required and you don't get one um, and, uh, within 60 days, the buyer can cancel. Um, <clears throat> um, Emilio, I'll, I'll, I don't remember what, what it was, so I'll just say um, watch the recording because it is being recorded. Um, and then if you, uh, in regards to 3B, if you know that there is a court confirmation and you check, you, once again, you have to check that box in order for it to be a, a contingency. So um, um, let's see if the property is under independent uh, in the power parties are attempting to modify the agreement to include any of these provisions the parties are advised to seek, uh, just telling them to seek the advice of counsel. <clears throat> um, okay, so any questions on that court confirmation thing there? Uh, hi, Rich, could I ask you a quick question going back? I, I wasn't connected. Uh, going back to sure. rental property owner disclosure and or questionnaires. Are these for uh -huh. like one to four units or are these for any residential? Well, they should be if it's a if it if it's oh, that's a good question. Let me see what this says. If it if it specifies um one to four. It doesn't specify one to four. Uh, right. I would say then it, it is for any rental property. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, 
All right, PA. Sorry. Um, the rental income purchase agreement. Okay. So they added language 3M. Wait, where are we? 3. Is it 3M1? Where are we? 3LM1. Oh, okay. Regarding possession, vacant units to be delivered vacant. Um, so they added to make it explicit that vacant units and seller occupied units are to be delivered vacant. So obviously, if there are vacant units in the property as presently, then the seller should not be putting somebody in there prior to the close of escrow, obviously. And then if it's a seller occupied unit, obviously the seller has to get out. So they made it clear to um, th that part of it and that obviously you, you need to do a TOPA, remember TOPA tenant occupied, um, <clears throat> something I can't remember it's, it went out of my head um, but I know it's time to occupant uh, occupancy sellers shall disclose the buyer which units are occupied by tenants if a tenant occupied unit is delivered vacant pursuant to um, paragraph 3 and blah 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 uh, sellers responsibly responsible for delivering the unit vacant occupancy may impact available financing so um, they made that clear in um, number seven about occupancy. Um, and then also paragraph 14, where are we? Did I pass it? No, uh, 12, 14, security deposits and unearned rent security deposits if any to the extent they have not been applied by seller in accordance with any rental agreement and current law and all prepaid but unearned rents if any shall be transferred to the buyer on the close of escrow sellers shall notify each tenant regarding the security dep deposits in compliance with california civil code so if they collected prepaid rent then those need to be turned over to the buyer. So that's that's what that. So that was the change in the rental property, uh, uh, rental income property purchase agreement. Any questions on that? Yes. I believe it's mm -hmm. a residential income property. Not residential, yeah, I guess. I'm, I'm so fixated on rental. Yes, thank you, residential. No <laughs> and now going to residential uh, listing agreements. No, nope, that's the wrong one. Uh, residential, where am I? Not the RPA, the listing agreement. Okay, residential listing agreement, paragraph 4C added to address, oh, um, they're just addressing smart home features um, because um, we all know that, you know, all, all these homes have been, you know, um, tricked out. Uh, presentation of offers. So this is the least listing agreement, uh, the residential listing agreement. So presentation, of, there are different strategies for accepting before obtaining the best offer for seller. Seller is advised that certain buyers may prefer not to be in a competitive situation. This is interesting that they added this. And either may not make an offer if there is an introduction that all offers will be presented at a later specified time or may try to make a preemptive offer that will expire in hopes seller will accept before the presentation date. Seller is, is advised to discuss and con consider the best strategy for the seller. So 
they're finally addressing this in the listing agreement. A lot of us agents, I've done it in the past, is like, okay, you're, pu- you're going to put it on the market and then um, we're not going to look at offers until after our first, our first um, open house. And then there's always those buyers who, uh, hey, I want, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my offer in and it expires, you know, before you can do, you know, do this. It, you know, you have to have a discussion with your seller as to what, what is best for them. Um, you're not getting as much exposure if you're not allowing the show, you know, if you're accepting an offer in the middle of, and then you get agents that are pissed off at you because, well, you said you weren't looking at offers until, you know, until this day. Well, my seller changed their mind. What am I supposed to do? You, you have to be, um, you have to go by what, you know, your seller wants. So they've addressed this in the listing agreement. So either, you know, the brokers to present the offers as they come in or the, or the sellers instructing the broker not to present offers until a later date. So then you have it in writing from the seller. I'm not, we're not accepting offers until this, until this date. So um, that's a, you know, that's a, a strategy and a, and a tactic that you, you just need to have with your seller. Not, not all sellers, you know, there is going to be those sellers. Well, I don't care what the buy, you know, this buyer says, let them go away. I'm going to, you know, you know, it's, um, you know, some sellers are ticked off by, by that. So uh, it's, it encourages a conversation about a strategy. And so you, you guys should be thinking about how you're going to address this because it's now, um, it's now in the listing agreement. Amelia, you had a question. <clears throat> or not. Where'd you go? <laughs> you raised your hand. <laughs> All right. Okay. If you, if you come back, then um, this is all that I had in the, in the listing agreement. But um, any questions about this? Um, it, it, and if you ask me, I, I don't, you know, I, every seller is going to be different because I know that you guys are going to ask me about, well, what do you think is the best strategy? Every seller is going to be different. Um, so um, uh, your questions on that, what do you mean by your questions on that? Do, uh, do we have to put in, into the MLS in this case? If the seller is, has instructed you, a uh, good question. If your seller has instructed you that you're not looking at offers until a later date, then yes, you should be putting that in the private remark of the MLS that um, we, will, we will be looking at offers uh, on Monday, blah, 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 blah. Because what the the buyer and the buyer's agent is going to say is I've given you an offer and you need to look at it. You need to present offers as they're given, but, and which is true because that's an MLS rule. But if the seller has instructed you, I don't want to look at offers until this date, then you have to go by what the, uh, the seller has instructed you to do. And here it is in writing in your listing agreement. So. So that's, so that's that. Um, so yes, you would have to put it in the, um, the MLS. Okay. The, the, the residential lease agreement has been changed basically to, to, to instruct the, um, instruct the uh, rental property owner that they need to provide those, um, those documents, the rental property owner disclosure and the rental property owner questionnaire. Um, the seller, just as in the buyer counteroffer, the seller counteroffer has also been changed to reflect that appraisal gap. So I don't have to, and in the seller multiple counteroffer. So I don't have to go up, uh, go through, um, 
go through that. They've changed, I'm not going to bring it up, but they've changed the seller, the statewide buyer and seller advisory. Paragraph A15 was added to explain preliminary reports and the importance of reading documents referred to in them, such as CCNRs. Paragraph, I know that buyers don't read the statewide buyer and seller advisory, but believe me, um, in lawsuits, it's brought up. Did you sign this? Yes, I did, because there's a lot of disclosures in there. Uh, paragraph D10 was added to make the parties aware of the impact that state and local jurisdictions may have on the sale and continued use of the property due to laws eliminating the use of carbon fuel appliances in favor of those items powered by the electric grid. As you might know, uh, California is get away, getting away from, from carbon fuels. And by 20, 2030, I believe no new construction will have gas appliances. Um, paragraph F3 was modified to create awareness to the right to have discriminatory, discriminatory covenants removed from title. For those of you who don't know, if a buyer sees in the CCNRs that there is some, because we know these documents have been around forever, that there is some discriminatory uh, covenant in, in, the, um, in the CCNRs, they can have that, they individually can have that removed and all of that. Um, paragraph F8 was modified to address those situations where fees or credits to solar power system owners may be reduced or otherwise changed, okay? Well, that was the statewide um, buyer and seller advisory. Um, Seller property questionnaire, added language above paragraph one for use if property contains two to four units. Well, what did they change? I'm just curious. Um, SPQ, where are we? SPQ. Oh, so there's a checkbox that this property is a duplex, triplex, or fourplex. An SPQ, aha, an SPQ is required for all units. This SPQ is for all units or only this unit. I, an SPQ, an SPQ, I think you can get away with checking it for all units because although if an individual unit was remodeled, Mm, don't go by i gotta think about that one mm, okay anyways tds was also changed with this very same change um that it's for two to four units um so just uh just know that seller's purchase of replacement okay well let's go to that one okay uh, i'm i think i'm almost done here so bear with me um Seller, okay. All right, the seller purchase of replacement property. Um, language was added to optional paragraph 1B to indicate that if seller has already entered into a contract to acquire other property, then the contingency for finding replacement property is eliminated. Okay, so if paragraph if this paragraph is checked, so you'll see under 1B, if this paragraph is checked, then the time periods in 2A, the buyers, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, what are they talking about? Added in 1B, 1B, sellers entering and finding replace. oh, they've added finding replacement property contingency is removed. So that's what they've done. So if you're already in escrow, you don't have to find a replacement property. So that's that. Um, paragraphs four and five were added to identify the buyer and seller 
uh, respective rights to cancel. So the buyer can cancel the agreement if after first giving seller notice to perform and seller fails to remove the finding replacement property contingency, or B, if paragraph 1C, which is close of replacement property, um, close of replacement property is after first giving seller no sperm, seller fails to remove the closing on the replacement property. If seller is unable to meet the obligations of other time frames in the agreement, such as for close of escrow, buyer can cancel as permitted in the agreement, even if this contingency is not removed. The seller's right to cancel if, if prior to seller's removal of finding the uh, replacement property contingency, seller is unable to enter into contract to acquire a replacement property. Um, okay, so those gives the, the rights to the buyers and the sellers their rights to cancel. Uh, any other questions regarding that? Not seeing any. Um, so, um, uh, so Rich, this is used if the seller is looking for replacement property and that that's yes, closed. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, so the tenant, the TOPA, tenant occupied property addendum, that's what I couldn't think of the, before. Um, <clears throat> paragraph 10B added to address, pre uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, paragraph 1B3 added to create obligation of the seller to identify the names of all occupant, adult occupants on the property, whether or not paying rent. So, um, so that was added to the tenant occupied property addendum. Um, why is that important? Well, you have an adult there, could be a relative of the seller. And there are many um, stories about relatives not wanting to move, even though um, uh, they're supposed to. Um, so that's, that's always important to know. So, um, uh, so that's, that's basically all the change on this, the TOPA. Um, the vacant land listing agreement, it also, um, it goes into the presentation of offers. Once again, do we want delayed offers? Um, um, and then the land purchase agreement, let's see. And purchase vacant land purchase agreement. Three E. Where are you? Three E. Um, they've added. Is this intent the intended use for an investment? That's interesting. Investment because um, if it's if it's for an investment, it could affect the loan. So um, that's that's important to know and i know that i can't remember somebody i can't somebody told me about um they had sold a property to somebody and it was owner they, they represented the buyer buyer represented that it was owner occupied then they, the buyer, evident now the owner contacted them to rent it. The agent was contacted by the lender saying this is supposed to be owner occupied. So that's, we all have to remember, you know, people get a, you know, for a primary resident, they get a, um, a, a deal on the, um, the uh interest rate so if you're saying i'm gonna i'm gonna move into it and use it as my primary resident and then you have no the mr buyer has no intention of doing so that's called fraud so we don't want to be involved with that 
Um, this person had no idea out of the blue, they were, you know, they, they thought that they were moving into it, <clears throat> but out of the blue, they contacted them and, oh, no, we're going to rent it out for a while. Would you rent it for us? And then, and then all this happened. So, um, so be very careful about that. Don't assist somebody um, in trying to defraud a lender. Um, 10B in vacant land, uh, governmental point of sale requirements. Remember, there are still some point of sale requirements on land, even if it's uh, vacant land. 9A, if it's in LA, 9A is still a governmental point of sale requirement. You still have to um, pull a 9A. Um, solar system, I don't know why a solar system is being put on a vacant land, but who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> that, okay, so uh, that's pretty much all of the ones that I wanted to cover. Um, and I think we went through pretty much all of them. That, anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm not Rich. seeing any. Uh, yeah. Rich, let me ask you just uh, quickly, and I'm so sorry, I I, I I tuned in a little bit later. So is there like a big, it seems like there's a big change. So there is a, uh, a name landlord is not used yes. anymore. We no it's longer not... use, I, I don't know why. We don't want, I mean, we no longer use the term landlord. It's, um, what is it? Wait, I got it. Housing I don't even provider, remember what. right? Housing provider. It's housing provider. Yes. Because and here's the rationale. I, I actually do know why. It, it, the rationale is that it's not always the owner that's providing the housing. There are property managers who are out there, and they're providing the the um, the, um, the the housing. You never deal with the owner. You're dealing with a property manager. And I'm th I'm rethinking what I said to you. Um, Joan, if if it is a property that that if you're dealing with a property manager on a you know that's your contact in providing this housing, then they would be the one to fill out these documents, not the Great. not the owners. Perfect. Yeah. That, that, that's what okay. I needed to know. Yeah, I, 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 I think and thinking about it, I, I you know I yeah. I'm going over it. Yeah, that's that's what if that's truly who you're dealing with. If that's Who's Correct. signing the paperwork? Who's doing? Yeah, you know, they're the ones who would sign it. So that's why it's no longer called landlord; it's called housing provider. So. And will the uh, KW forms in regards to leases, like the disposition form, like yeah. MP, uh, are we going to be changing no. that? <laughs> no, we're not going to be changing it. If CAR wants to change it, then they can. I, I, I don't. I don't foresee us needing to change it um you know it's just the technicality i mean they're they're just trying they're just trying to be i don't know i don't i, I really don't so um so um no we won't be changing it we'll, we'll still use we'll still use the, the same so okay um i see one other what's this uh uh any other questions not bad, all those revisions, you know, going over a little over an hour, but hey, thank you. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. I'm going to stop my recording.